Hello and welcome to Good Game, the show for gamers by gamers. He's Junglist. And he's Badjo. First of all, big thank you to everyone who dropped by our forums. And welcome to the gamers who stayed up way past their bedtimes on Friday night to catch us on Standard Def TV. This week's games are all about flipping. We'll be flipping some tricks on Skate Junk. Could this be the one game to push Tony Hawk off the ramp? And flipping from 2D to 3D is the hook of our favorite plumber's latest outing, Super Paper Mario. And Lux joins the team and we'll be taking a look at what your online avatar really says about you. Plus we'll be meeting the Aussies taking on the world at the World Cyber Games in Seattle this week. But first, time to button on and defrag those hard drives. Can you guess the name of the game this week? And for an extra point, can you tell us the name of the developer that worked on it as their first paid gig in the industry? Not so much of a retro game, Jung, but answer at the end of the show. That's how it's done. Hey, nice moves, Badge. Did you get smaller? <laughs> okay, that wasn't me. That was John Ratray, pro skater. He features in the new skateboard simulation game titled Skate. Skate for the 360 is a new trick in a genre that up until now has been completely dominated by Tony Hawk games. It's up to you to learn the tricks, get your photo taken, make your own movie, and get on a magazine cover. After you build your character and pick your skate style, I went for Goofy, you're thrown into a world that is pretty much built just for skating. Every single rail and park bench just screams to be grinded. Yes, indeed, it is suspicious. Your skate journey takes you from the laid-back schoolyards of the suburbs to the traffic-filled steep hills of the city as you out-trick and out-race your opponents to become the king of skating. You even get to wear a shirt with a crown on it. That's pretty cool. All the missions are set up kind of GTA style, but without all the lame gangster references. You can also control the amount of population and traffic you want in the city, but it's more fun to leave it in there. We'd miss out on the often hilarious collisions. Ah. Well, Merry Christmas to you too. Hey. Yo, be careful in the street, man. These cars will hit you. You okay? Do go back to your cave. But you don't have to free roam around the city to get your mission points, so you can point and click your way to the top as well. Yeah, but it's not as much fun, you know. The world is really detailed, and the whole skateboard video low angle-like feel to it reminds me a bit of the way Gears of War used their camera angles to strengthen the action. Yeah, a lot of people talk about Gears of War and how the graphics were so amazing, but they don't realize it was half amazing graphics and half cinematic camera angles. Yeah, number 54. Well, we're on the techie stuff, Jung. I've got to mention the sound. Every single bump and shimmy in this game just sounds like it should. Plus, all the characters in the game have this whatever-like monotone voice, and it just really gels. Dude, the community center is a perfect place to learn the basics. Do a big ollie. Hold the right stick down until your knees are fully bent, and then flick it straight up. If you hold the right stick down just like an ollie, then flick it off to the right, you'll do a kick flip or a heel flip, depending on your strength. There is a lot to do in Skate besides trying to jump over cars and being chased by security. Hmm, there's races, trick contests, photo ops, secret swimming pools, spots to own. To climb the ranks, you also need to record your own trick videos. And this gets really interesting, Jung, because they give you a set of criteria, like so many points you have to earn and certain tricks to do, but it's up to you to find the spot in the world to do it. And it's up to you to look as lead as possible while doing it. There's also a large amount of unlocks, such as boards and other sorts of gear, ranging from the very dorky to the uber cool. It'd be nice to have a bit more silly stuff in it. Now, but, Jung, you were in E3. Did you run into anyone from Skate? Now that you mention it, I did. And uh, I had to ask him, why are you so willing to take on Tony Hawk at the genre he himself invented? Next-gen consoles gave us the opportunity to really create the skateboard experience, to make it feel like skateboarding, more than just be a game about skateboarding. And we wanted to take that on. There's a lot of people who didn't like Tony Hawk, thought it was too hard, too many buttons to learn. We thought we could bring something new. That's why we wanted to make the game. So it's good they've landed it, so to speak. 
You know what I like about this the most, Jung, is the constant recording feature. Basically, at any stage, you can go back 20, 30 seconds and take that footage and mix it up, change camera angles and change the footage colour, and uh, then you can upload it online and share it amongst the world. Yeah, it is a pretty good idea. We couldn't actually get the video playback to work, though, because of a bug. We did also find another bug where you could kind of skate off into oblivion in the sky. Yeah, we, we hope these are fixed for the final release, but it, it really is the first true skateboard simulation game, isn't it? It's more techy. And it does punish you if you land a, a jump wrong or if you bump over something you shouldn't. You will be ragdolling your way to broken bones. You know, it's uh, Tony Hawk games, you're very much glued to the skateboard, and at first I was a little bit worried about that with this, but once you finally start learning and pulling off the tricks, it, it's a pretty big learning curve, but it's more rewarding. It's less arcadey like Tony Hawk as well, you know? It's less about chaining together heaps and heaps of tricks that would never be done in real life. It's more like you make one trick and you feel good. Final thoughts, Pat? You know, I spent about an hour trying to do this one particular trick, and by the time I got enough multipliers and I got up the top, I was knocked over by you know, another skater, and it makes me think that online is going to be a lot of fun with this. I'm flipping nine out of ten rubber chickens on this baby. Yeah, you know, I'm not really into skating games usually, but I did find myself coming back to this one for the physics and the uh, true-to-life feel and the rewarding nature of the game. I'm giving it eight and a half out of ten rubber chickens. Sony have confirmed that they will be producing a six-axis controller with rumble, the DualShock 3. Some games in development, like Metal Gear Solid 4, will have the function included, and others will require it to be downloaded. Liquid. Sony are maintaining that it was technical difficulties with the controller and not the lawsuit with Immersion, the creators of the rumble technology, that held things up. Expect to see the controller in 2008. Schools in the United Kingdom are being urged to take action against cyberbullying after a government survey found more than a third of young teenagers had experienced it. Cyberbullying can take the form of intimidation, harassment, publication of private information or images, and cyberstalking. Schools in the UK now have the authority to get offensive and hurtful material removed from social networking sites and confiscate mobile phones from students caught using them to bully. The iconic 70s punk band The Sex Pistols have returned to the studio to re-record Anarchy in the UK for the upcoming Guitar Hero 3 Legends of Rock. Singer John Lydon, guitarist Steve Jones, and drummer Paul Cook reformed for the first time in 30 years as the original multi-track recordings had been lost. The game will be released in early November. Lux joins the Good Game team. Over the next few weeks, she'll be meeting lots of gamers and tackling some of the issues that they and you may face when you play online. Online bad behaviour, for example, or online relationships. But to kick things off, what your online self really says about you. Some people have pets and other people have avatars. In a world where we often feel we have little control, our online self can be anything we want it to be. An avatar to me is like an alter ego, like your ultimate alter ego in a virtual world. To me, it's something that I would fantasize about, something surreal in games, something out there. It's like a caricature of the player. Otherwise, it's just me. A lot of role-playing games allow you to modify the appearance and skills of your character in order to make it your very own. And even if role-playing isn't your genre, there are plenty of other games that you can use nicks and tags to form your identity. Uh, my nick is stealth underscore NT, which every time I play games, I'm always the one who likes to sneak around. Uh-huh. So hence the stealth yeah, right. and NT, my initials. So what does your avatar say about you? Well, I play a Blood Elf level 70 mage, yeah. and I decided to go one from my old Tauren Druid just because it resembles me a little bit more than a lanky cow. My character is a human paladin in the World of Warcraft. Mm -hmm. um, I've had the character for about two years now. The character is based around the Ant Norris. Uh -huh. Yeah, so you're a bit of a Chuck Norris fan? Yeah, yeah, I am. Yeah. Now, what I find really interesting is that research tells us the way our avatar looks can affect our play and the way other people treat us. A good motivation, I think, for putting a little extra time into getting a cool-looking character. So, Tom, tell us a little bit about your avatar. Um, short, green-haired gnome, so not really just resembling me much yes. at all, but... 
little bit cutesy and a little bit girly yeah. as well, Tom. What's that all about? It gives you a bit of trading power in the game if people, yeah. you know, some people that are really into the game will see that if you're a girl, they'll like to, you know, give you a bit of money at the start or something to help yeah, you out, right. try and get friends with you. Even if you're a guy playing a girl? Well, they're not going to know that, so... Okay. The Daedalus Project, a study exploring the psychology of MMOs, suggests that more attractive players seem to play fairly in game. But doesn't that all come down to perception? Yes, I always play female characters because um, I think they're usually cuter and they have more clothing choices. And I think sometimes they look a bit sexier, you uh -huh. know, because usually they're designed by men. And so even though it's not all about your appearance and what clothes you're wearing and things like that, it sounds yeah. like identity is still important. Yes, it is, um, because the identity of a character displays on how he will respond to commands on the battlefield. Yeah. And research also shows that a large percentage of people use their avatars to flirt with one another. Over half of all players interviewed have developed virtual romantic relationships. Apparently, taller or bigger avatars are more dominant and less likely to play fair. I guess I'm just a bit intimidating for lower level characters when yeah. they just seem to just all run away. Yeah. So that's just, that's a good rush when like 15 people just run away from you. It's yeah. always fun. Is that why you chose such a big character? Well, I've played other characters, but this was the easiest. It didn't need that much thinking. Yeah, right. Because everybody else plays around your strategy. Uh -huh. The sex of your avatar could be an advantage too, although this is yet to be proven. When you're a girl player, like I said, like people always like offer a helping hand for you and stuff. And they like, if you level up, they'll be all like, Oh, congratulations, you leveled up. When you're a guy character, no one really notices or cares. And it's just like they pass it off. Unless they notice you're high level, in this case, they're like, oh, help me, help me. So go for it. Be as creative as you like when designing your avatar. But remember, with every detail you add, you could be revealing more and more about the person behind the computer. You know, creating your online avatar is actually a lot easier than that. Oh, really? Yeah, I mean, all you got to do is take two words and smush them together. It's what the role-playing games do. What are you talking about, Junglist? Well, I have here a random name generator, guaranteed to give you a cool nickname. Eat your heart out, Lexi. How does this work? Well, you just pick out a name. Over. Kill. Smush them together, overkill, wicked. That's actually pretty accurate. All yeah. right, give me a go. Ah, oh, but wait, let's make this interesting. Mm. Whatever you pick out has to be your name for the rest of the episode. All right, fair enough, fair enough. Tiger, not bad, not bad. Well done, Tiger Gimp, what's next? Quarter circle A. help you, sir? Uh, excuse me? What are you doing here? I'm here to, like, rescue the princess and stop you overthrowing the kingdom. Wait, what? Don't play games with me, King Crunchy. Ah, oh, forget this. Sarah, can you come out here, please? Danny, I told you we were over. I'm so sorry about all of this, Charles. It's like he's obsessed or something. Don't tell him that. I'm here to rescue you, princess. Rescue? Hey, hey buddy, we were just watching DVDs here. I don't know what you think is going on, but... No more tricks, Crunchy. I demand you release the princess and give up your evil throne. Um, you do realize that King is just a nickname. Oh yeah? Well, if, uh, if, if you're not the evil King, well, why do you have so many henchmen outside? Um, henchmen? Yeah, the entire crew! They have been killed! Oh my god, what did you do? I... Uh, I thought they were henchmen. What are you talking about? They're landscapers. I'm having my garden done. The, but... But they're, they're small and green. I... Oh, so if they're small and green, they must take up a life of crime, huh? Uh, that is so racist. You are the racistest racist I've ever seen. Hey, Sarah! Look at your racist ex-boyfriend, the racist! We could never go to restaurants. Good game! Get him! Get him! 
The world's best e-athletes are gathering in Seattle for this year's grand final of the World Cyber Games. 700 contestants from over 75 different countries will be battling it out over eight different games for the right to call themselves world champion and over half a million dollars in prize money. Including, of course, some Aussies. We caught up with the gamers who'll be making Team Australia at the World Cyber Games National Final in Sydney last month. Gunstar Red, who's just won the Dead or Alive 4 Grand Final. How do you feel, man? I feel great. It's a great relief and it's really exciting. Tell me about the character you use. Now, she's a pretty hard one to use for a beginner, isn't she? Um, she's okay for a beginner, but it's she's a little harder to get um, really great results with easily. So, yeah, I just like her style. She, she's got good interrupts, defensive and offensive. So what's the Dead or Alive scene like in Australia? Are we at the pro level yet, or do we still have a ways to go? Uh, we definitely have a ways to go, because I've played a few of the guys who are pros um, or at that level online, and they're much better than me. Here it is, folks, the final, the Counter-Strike 1.6 match. Whoever wins this can declare themselves the best 1.6 team in Australia and gets a free trip to Seattle. Immunity have been the favorites to win today. However, Sequential did beat them 16 to five earlier. Immunity is also known to play mind games, so it's gonna be a great match. The Captain Miles, a.k.a. Rise, how are you, man? How do you uh, feel? Can't explain it. It just feels awesome. Well, do you have any uh, tips for people out there aspiring to become Counter-Strike champions? Um, play a lot. Um, practice makes perfect, I suppose. you just got to keep at it. What do you think was the key to beating immunity just then? I think our momentum as a team. It wasn't an individual effort. It was our whole team. We all just played amazing. I noticed you had a lot of rushes where it was like on all sides, mid, left yeah, that, and right. That did help a lot, actually, because sometimes when you when you rush a lot and you get shut down, you kind of um, you lose spirit and you start playing defensive and not your own game. We were fortunate enough to get our few rushes off at the start so we could keep putting pressure on them, and they eventually just cracked. That was, I think, the key. Well, it's the defense of the Ancients grand final, or as it's better known, Dota, the Warcraft 3 mod. Let's check it out. I'm here with TKS, who've just won the grand final of Dota. How do you feel? Excited. What sort of preparation do you go into to win an event like this? Because some of these matches, they don't just go for 10 minutes, do they? They're quite long. No, like, we spend like three or four hours a night um, practicing with each other. And since we're split up, like, most of us is from Melbourne and half of them is from Sydney. So we have to get online and practice together. We've been in a team for over a year and a half, like the current members. Our team looks quite good at the moment, but like, it can be improved. Uh, but so like, we've, we've been playing games like this for quite a while, so it's quite easy for us. What's the community like, the Dota community? Is it really fierce competition or is Australia up to the rest of the world standard-wise? Australia is not quite up there yet, but like, we're getting there. Right now, Europe's been dominating for quite a while, so. We're going to be there soon. Well, it's been a long, hard day of gaming, but it doesn't stop now. The Gears of War 4 vs 4 Grand Finals happening right here. Let's check it out. I'm here with Andrew from Malice. The Gears of War Grand Finals. Well done, guys. You're going to Seattle. How do you yes, feel? Yes, so we feel fantastic. Far out. Um, 
Last game was a really tight one, uh, but yeah, we came up with a good to McConaughey, Seattle, yeah. Do you think there's any similarities in playing esports compared to regular sports? Are you thinking the same things in your mind? Um, actually, that was really funny. My friends in real life, they all have their soccer finals today, and I'm like, yeah, I got my um, computer game finals today as well. So it's definitely becoming more popular with general community, and it, I think it's great. Like, you know, not everyone that plays computer games is nerds. What is the community like for Gears of War? Is it a massive online community, or how, how popular is it? Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of people that play. Um, a couple hundred thousand, I don't, I don't really know the exact figures, but everyone says over a million. Over a million people in um, online on the world, so there's definitely a lot of people out there that enjoy playing Gears. And what do your family think of um, how much you play games? Um, they, oh, my mum really hates it, it drives her insane. <laughs> um, I just rang her as soon as we went, I was like, Mum, we're going to Seattle! But, was yeah. there a hesitation to the excitement? No, no, I rang her so right. she was like, oh, that's fantastic, but yeah, it's, <laughs> they, they hate it, but they're happy for me though, we won. If you'd been in Japan or the US any time since April, you may have noticed a great looking game called Super Paper Mario. Then you might have asked, why haven't I got this game in Australia? Do Nintendo just release games overseas that sometimes don't get here? Well, the answer is no. Sometimes it does take a really long time to get it here. Super Paper Mario takes us back to the good old days of 2D platforming fun. It has its roots set in a series of Mario role-playing games where you choose your attack in a turn-based fashion. But this time they've gone for a new approach. They've kept some of the RPG elements like quests, items and hit points, but Mario has a new trick where he can flip the world from 2D to 3D to solve puzzles. It's great fun for nostalgic gamers and new ones alike. And it's brilliant, isn't it? That whole 2D to 3D mechanic, uh, it's great and, and it's executed brilliantly. I was a bit worried at the start that it was going to be uh, an easy solution to every problem, you know? Like you can't get past a chasm, go to 3D. You can't get past a big monster, go to 3D. It is a bit of an I win button junk, but it's what platformers needed, you know? A bit of innovation. There's also four different characters, each with their own ability. Is this made for kids, or do you think this is something families would like? Well, you would think so, and it's a fun game to play in a group, but uh, I don't think kids would like it just because of the massive amount of text in this game. Uh, occasionally you look at the text and, you know, it's pretty funny and pretty clever, but there's so much of it, even adults would just spool through it and say, I don't have the time. I mean, it looks like, you know, it's a hybrid game, and it feels like they're experimenting with this. You know, without hybrids, we wouldn't have games like Grand Theft Auto, so it is a good thing to do, but does it really work here? Yeah, it only really works if the two sides work well together. I mean, here it feels like they've got a foot in both camps and it's just not working for them, you know? Every single platforming element they put inside this game works brilliantly, and every RPG element they hung on to just holds it back. And there was this one level where you're in a hamster wheel and you just have to keep running and holding down the button, and it went on for no joke, about 10 to 15 minutes. Where is the fun in that? It's not fun at all. One thing that was pretty good, though, was the star power. When you get a star, it turns into this whole 2D etch-a-sketch Godzilla Mario where you run amok through the whole level, and that was great. I think they managed to capture the feel of the old Mario games very well as well, through the music and the graphics. But let me put it this way, would you play it again? No way. There's just no way anyone would put themselves through that amount of text twice. But when it's all said and done, it's the most charming platformer we've played in a long time. It's great fun and there's a good amount of playtime here. 8 out of 10 Rubber Mario chickens from me. I want to point out there's a PSP game called Crush, which has the same 2D to 3D mechanic without all the text. So if this one catches your eye, then that one's worth a look as well. But you said it, Badge. The charm of this game is undeniable. It's a lot of fun, but it's a shame it's held back by its former RPG self. I'm giving it 7 out of 10 rubber chickens. Good game. Well, gamers, did you guess the game for this week? Not such a hard one, as it's not really that old. The first official game that I worked on was at Sony Online, and uh, that was Jeopardy. <laughs> it was kind of like, you know, not all games can be like the big, big productions like Assassin's Creed, so that was my first game, my first official job out of school. Well, that's it for this week, gamers. Next week, what would happen if the Cold War never ended and America was invaded by Russia? It's the setting for the new real-time strategy game, World in Conflict. We handed some chickens. Plus, I get the chance to meet a personal hero of mine, Mr. Stan Lee, the creator of Spider-Man, X-Men, Hulk, and many more. We talk about how Spidey has influenced modern culture and, of course, video games. And we take a look at the evolution of the adventure game, where it started, where it's gone, and the influence it's had on everything else. Drop by our forums, gamers, and let us know what's pushing your buttons. Until next time, overkill out. Tiger Gimp out.